Hello, good afternoon. We are sitting here at the Vienna International Center, where the 50, sorry, the 61st first session of the Commission on Narcotic Drugs, uh, the, the annual meeting of the United Nations on Drug Policies, uh, is taking place. And uh, 10 years ago, uh, in 2009, uh, the United Nations adopted a political declaration and an action plan. And uh, according to this action plan, uh, drug use and drug tra trafficking should be uh, significantly reduced or eliminated in 10 years. And this, this uh, action plan will expire next year, uh, so the, the governments will have a high-level uh, ministerial, high ministerial meeting here in Vienna uh, to discuss how to go forward. And uh, now governments actually are discussing uh, how to assess uh, the impacts of, of, of what, what has been done and how to evaluate uh, global drug control policies. And I have here uh, uh, Marie Nougier from the International Drug Policy Consortium and uh, Stiger Zorheim from uh, Norway, from the EURAD uh, organization. And we will discuss uh, their views about uh, where this process is leading us. Uh, so my first question to you is, uh, uh, how, how do you evaluate this, this, this process which is going on right now here at the, at the CND, like where we are now and what, when, what we can expect from the, from the next year's uh, high-level meeting? Whoever wants to start. Okay, I will start. <laughs> Hi, Peter. Hi, everyone. So, um, so this is an interesting time now at the CND here because there's a lot of discussions around what the modalities for 2019 segment should be. Uh, there is also a lot of controversial points. One of them is about what should be the focus of the meeting. Should it be around the 2009 political declaration or should it be around the 2016 ANGAS? Um, so, you know, the ANGAS was a key moment uh, for drug policy, in particular for people promoting drug policy reform, but I think for every single civil society really in the field, uh, it gives more prominence to human rights, it gives more prominence to health, to criminal justice reform and to development. And so for many member states, they agree with us on this, but many other more conservative member states do want to keep the focus on the 2009 political declaration and the sole objective of achieving a drug-free society. Um, so, so the debates are around this. So now the negotiations here at CND are around these modalities and what the debate is going to be about. There's also a lot of discussions around what the evaluation is going to be about. So for now, there's no mechanism around what the, ev the evaluation of the 2009 goals and targets are. Um, so we're, I mean, we're trying to work with member states on setting up a process that would, re that would be open and objective. So these are a bit like the, the issues that we see so far, but I'll let Stigeric respond as well. <laughs> yeah. Um we agree very much with uh, Marie here that the UNGAS document was a, a key step forward. Uh, I mean, I know a lot of organizations felt that it should have gone further. I think it was as far as the international consensus could go. And I think that what we're seeing is a slight reversal. Uh, we heard from the floor today, this morning, uh, a lot of the regional uh, organization talking about the 2009 objectives, uh, talking more about the, the 2009 document than about the, the UNGAS document. Uh, which I think is a pity because I think that, you know, for, for one, we spent a lot of time and resources into the UNGAS process and we wanted to make a better document. We wanted to make a more updated document that was more in line with the challenges that we're facing. And now we see sort of a, a backpedaling from, from a lot of organizations or not a lot of countries, uh, which I think is, is, is a pity. Um, and I think for us as civil society actors, I think that, you know, we can support our governments uh, or intergovernmental inter organizations like the e EU in calling for a greater focus on, on the UNGAS document than, than on the 2009 document. So I think that that's probably where the discussion or the, the difficult discussions are going in the next couple of weeks and months. And you know, 2019 is not so far away, so uh, you know, it's, um, yeah. How do you see what, what are the main issues where uh, the, the opinion of governments is, is, is not the same, so where, where, you know, where are di there are diverse opinions, uh, so where, where are these opposing views? I mean, there, are, there are a few of these. So the first one is around the death penalty and, and more broadly on human rights. So death penalty, extrajudicial killings, uh, the overall approach of very strong prohibition without any regard for human rights, basically, and those that want to promote a much more humane 
oriented approach. Yeah, so you see a lot of more conservative member states saying that the death penalty for drug offences is a deterrent approach. It works in their country, and so they want to continue promoting this approach. And they they are very very strong on this. Uh, so, for example, the use of the death penalty was not included at the ONGAS, uh, within the ONGAS outcome document, I mean, because a lot of member states actually called for the abolition of the death penalty within the general debates. So that's one of the very difficult points of contention. The second one, I guess, would be around harm reduction. Um, so harm reduction remains a controversial topic in Vienna. It has never been included in any of the CND resolutions since ever. <laughs> Um, and some member states still go, so more and more member states go in favor of harm reduction, but there are still member states who just come up and say we are against harm reduction, it doesn't work in our country, or we don't need harm reduction in our country. I think if you have drug use, you need harm reduction, that's as clear as this. Um, and the final topic is civil society. I mean, where are still, you know, there's still member states who do not want civil society in the room and they make it very clear. And a lot of the debates uh, or side debates within the modalities for 2019 are around what is the role of civil society, society? how is it going to be incorporated into the debates and, and how are even affected popu populations and communities going to be incorporated into the debates and the and the final products of of the un so i think these are for me the key kind of uh, issues but i don't know Stig Eric, if you have anything else no I, I agree and i think that the the ungas document even though it didn't mention harm reduction uh, the term harm reduction it actually mentioned a lot of the key harm reduction interventions which was you know a, a step in the right direction i think for for uh, that document uh, there was also a semi-structured uh, organization of civil society involvement uh, so we want to see a continuation of that um, and of course I mean uh, the, the, the issue of d the death penalty and human rights in general is is a key point uh, and I think that the, one of the challenges is that this uh, touches on a broader issue such as, as uh, non-interference in, in national affairs so, so some countries are very strong on this issue they do not want international or intergovernmental organizations to interfere in their internal affairs even even though they might even be agree with the with the issue they are on principle against interference so there there, there are some sort of macro political issues uh, involved as well uh, yeah okay so uh, so what we see is that the the united nation is is, is more and more divided on, on 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 drug policy issues and what we see is actually that why in some countries we have like extrajudicial killings for for growing cannabis and trafficking of cannabis other countries are actually making cannabis legal for uh, for for even for recreational use so uh, what is your organization's position on, on on this debate about about cannabis policies because uh, uh, some of some organizations are now urging governments to uh, to actually revise cannabis policies. Some uh, organizations would like to keep the status quo. So can you please talk about the position of your, your organizations on that? Do you want to start or no? Of course you should start. Yeah, I, I think that the, the issue of uh, cannabis is sort of challenging now for, for the UN uh, because in the plenary there's no discussion about cannabis. You know, in the within the consensus of the of the UN, there's no uh, discussion about legalization of cannabis. Uh, but at the same time, things are happening on the ground. And on the one hand, you have uh, states in the United States that are legalizing, not on the federal level, but on state level. Uh, you have Uruguay, and you have and now Canada, and starting to legalize. And and this, these developers are clearly in violation of the c conventions. Uh, so I think that the, the, the big issue for, for uh, uh, the UN system is how to deal with this because so far there's no there's no mechanism really to 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 prevent this or to accept this. Uh, I mean, we we as a uh, as a network support the the uh, the conventions, uh, and we don't want uh, to see legalization of cannabis at least uh, until <laughs> until we're forced to to accept it. Uh, but we w we want a public health oriented uh, policy and we want a humane approach to to cannabis and we want to see. Um, sort of uh, sen more sensible and uh, not a war on drugs approach to, to the issue. Um, but we are following the, the discussions in, in the, uh, on the UN level and we, we're, we're sort of curious, sort of questioning what, what's happening because the INCB, the International Narcotics Contro Control Board, are clearly saying that this is in violation of the conventions. 
uh, and uh, it doesn't seem to have any consequences. And we've seen uh, a lot of European countries have uh, experimented somewhat with their policies, but they, they've always been very clear to stay within the bounds of the, com of the conventions. Uh, so now that the, the, this, this consensus is, is fracturing, you know, you know, this might have consequences also on, on the, the European side of the Atlantic. No, I, I totally agree with Tigeric. So, I mean, we're all clear. Cannabis legalization is against the treaties. The treaties are clear about what is prohibited and what is permitted within the conventions. The, the issue, and as Stigeric said, it's, it's that there is absolutely no mechanism here to have an honest discussion about the global state of drug control. And member states need to acknowledge that this is happening and they need to discuss on the, what this means in terms of the drug control treaties. Most of the international drug control mechanisms have review mechanisms to reflect ongoing realities and to make sure that they're fit for purpose. This doesn't exist for the UN Drug Control Conventions, and now we're, we're in a situation where member states just don't talk about it with the hope that it's not going to happen or that just doesn't exist. And we're, we're far beyond that now. So, so, I mean, you know, within civil society, we've been starting to talk about two elephants in the room. The first one is cannabis legalization. The second one is the death penalty and extrajudicial killings. And for some reason, these are happening but no one really wants to talk about it. No one names any country. No one has any kind of incentive to reflect upon the fact that the drug control conventions really need a thorough review to make sure that these are acknowledged and addressed. The fact that people vote in favor of cannabis regulation means that there is a need. So if there is a need, how can the international drug control system ignore it? In terms of the human rights violations, there is a need to acknowledge those and make sure that they don't happen. So, so I think there is a fundamental problem with what is happening in the room here, because these discussions are not happening and they should be. So you are touching a very, uh, very, very sensitive and crucial issue here. Like, uh, if we don't really, you know. Uh, uh, implement these conventions, then they become in insignificant, actually. And uh, then the same can happen with, like, human rights conventions. So do you think that there is a re real danger of, of that, that, you know, that, pe that the governments will ignore the conventions and they will lose all significance and every government will do a drug policy which, which, which they, they want to do? And, and, and is this a problem, in your opinion, or, or should we just leave governments to, to pursue a drug policy which they want to pursue? I think this is this is a key issue because there is uh, it sets it sets a precedent uh, that a country can can ignore uh, a, 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 a binding document, uh, and you know there's, there should be procedures to to revise and to to discuss and review stuff, uh, and there are and but in this in this case there are, it's it's not being taken advantage of it's just been the the, the changes that have been carried out regardless of, of these procedures, and. Uh, and uh, I think it does set, set a, a risky precedent. I, I don't want to sort of exaggerate it, but I think there is a, there, there is this risk uh, that if governments are feel that they are or see that they can do what they like, uh, then uh, the the effect of the, the global agreements are are very limited. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I think the the fact that you would ignore the global drug conventions would or any other convention really undermines international law. And so that's why we need to find a way forward to make sure that international law remains where it is, but it needs to be fit for purpose. So if it has to be reviewed, then member states shouldn't shy away from, from reviewing them. And even if it is difficult. I mean, I think for the drug control treaties now, I mean, the way the discussions are going here in Vienna, there is no more consensus, it's clear. Member states just do not agree on the way forward. Some member states want more repression, some member states want to legalize, and then there is a massive spectrum in the middle. And maybe it's time to acknowledge that this is a reality and that there may need to be other conventions being signed on drug control that are either between like-minded countries or within regions which are more close to the realities of people on the ground that better reflect what is currently needed. But that requires leadership and strength, I guess. You want to ask but I think I think that this what is very clear when you come to Vienna for a couple of years, uh, you see that this is a very slow moving process. And I, I think that you know, for me, uh, the development up towards the Ungas was 
it was glacial in its pace, <laughs> but it was still a, a, a shift towards something that's more progressive, more up-to-date, more fit for purpose. Uh, so it's sort of discouraging to see that there is actually some countries that are re really working to reverse some of this, this pro progress. Uh, and I think that one of the tasks of civil, uh, civil society is to challenge and ex expand uh, the discussion. And uh, I think that a lot of questions can't really be handled in the plenary. Uh, you need to shift the, uh, the, the cons you need to shift the consensus. You need to do sort of the very slow work of shifting the consensus by uh, by uh, developing new ideas, developing new themes on the margins. And this is where I think that the civil society can can play a role. Uh, I think anybody who comes from a civil society organization uh, coming to a UN meeting and thinking that they can, you know, change something <laughs> will be very disappointed very quickly. But that doesn't that's not the same as saying. That is, it's, it's uh, futile. Mm -hmm. uh, so, I mean, uh, yeah. Sorry, just just on on this because I, I I agree. Like things move slowly here. I mean, it's my ninth CND, which is a bit scary. <laughs> um, I mean, you've gone to many or more, uh, but yeah, I think things change slowly, and but they change. And I remember in my first CND in 2010, I think two people mentioned harm reduction and one person mentioned human rights. You know, now we go here and it's almost the norm to mention human rights, you know, and it's, it's the norm to mention public health and to mention the needs of communities. And there is such a vibrant group of civil society coming to CND now. And, you know, we've done a lot of progress and that's been reflected at the ANGAS. I mean, the ANGAS debates were amazing. The round tables, the fact that we moved away from the three pillars of the UN, which were demand reduction, supply reduction, international cooperation. Now we talk about health, we talk about human rights, we talk about development, we talk about security, whatever, all of that stuff, gender, youth, you know, all of that stuff that was just not mentioned before. So we make progress, but I think it's the consensus is more and more difficult to achieve. And it's, it's getting tricky. And I think 2019 will be um, another moment where we'll see that get reaching consensus on drug control is becoming more and more difficult. So people who are watching us now probably at home they have several problems, huge problems such as like the opioid crisis in America with a lot of people dying in overdoses or you know, people are killed in the Philippines in the name of the war on drugs. Uh, uh, new psychoactive substances are coming uh, to, the, to the markets of European countries. So uh, is, is, is this meeting, can, can this meeting contribute to solving these problems uh, in individual countries? How, can you explain people like how this meeting is contributing to that? Like well, what kind of decisions are make, made here uh, is there any input given to, the, to, to, to those topics and what would you like to highlight from the discussions coming going on here well I, uh, I mean I, it, we always need to remind people that most of drug policy is shaped on the national level uh, and uh, the, the within the conventions the countries have quite quite a large degree of freedom to, to shape their policies uh, I mean the 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 most repressive regimes and the most liberal regimes are still within the bounds of the of the, uh, the conventions. So, you know, you, we shan't, you shouldn't always blame the UN uh, for for the failures of the national governments. Uh, but I think there are some issues that are touched on. I think that the the issue of, hu of human rights violations is difficult because the the member countries are very protective of their of their uh, uh, of their own national policies. So. Uh, but I think this is again an, a reminder for the Philippines that what they're doing is unacceptable. Uh, it's a reminder for the countries that still have uh, the death penalties that they actually have to get, go, get up there and, and defend their, their policies. Um, but on the more practical level, you, you talk about uh, overdoses, fentanyl. Uh, one of the, the resolutions that they are discussing today, or not today, this week, is uh, about the control of fent fentanyl. So this is sort of a practical way that the governments or the, the member states uh, collaborate on on uh, restricting access to to uh, um, to these uh, substances so there, there there are some 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 practical uh, or more yeah, more practical uh, aspects of this uh, where where they actually agree on some some procedures some rules uh, some common guidelines uh, and that's one example mm -hmm. yeah so so the resolution, so every year the CND adopts a series of resolutions. So Stig Eric mentioned the one on, on fentanyl and opioids, synthetic opioids, I think that's the way it's framed. Um, so 
these aim to guide governments on their national policies for the year the years ahead uh, so there are a few resolutions that are of interest so the fentanyl one is one of them the opioid uh, one unfortunately for now it doesn't include much on health it's very focused on law enforcement and so we're working really hard with member states to make sure that they can rebalance that resolution to make sure that yeah there is a component on law enforcement but most of it is health we see it in the US, we see it in Canada. The way you need to address these issues is with harm reduction treatment services, right? Um, then there's another resolution that's really interesting this year that's presented by Canada, and it's around reducing or addressing stigma in access to healthcare settings. And, and that's really important because there's just so much stigma around the world on drug use and people, it's, it's a massive deterrent on accessing services and on making sure that people get the need that they need, that, that they, yeah, to, you know, get the, the need that they require. And uh, yeah, so I think CND is good for this because it, we can put some good wording in there um, and make sure that the resolutions guide member states in the right direction. But then in the plenary session, I know that the plenary can be very inaccessible and it can also be very dry, but it's also a possibility for member states to condemn some of the things that are not acceptable. So for example, the EU this morning, I mean, I don't know if you guys listened to it, I think you, you filmed it, but it was very strong against extrajudicial killings and very strong against the death penalty and very you know, strong in favor of a health approach, of a humane approach towards drugs. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think these are good opportunities. And then there are side events. I went to an amazing side event today that was organized by Amnesty International and it showed the human face of the war on drugs and human rights defenders who are trying to make sure that they are protected for the work that they do and they are, they are a constant target of governments. So people on the ground suffer from human rights violations, but be people who try to protect them are also victims of these human rights violations. Yeah. So, so I think there's something we need to keep in mind and we may need to make sure that the people who are affected by drug policies come to CND and share their story with the delegates and with other civil society there. So that's another opportunity to kind of make sure that that voice is heard. Just to conclude our uh, discussions, I would like to uh, uh, say that Actually, that's a real pity that the governments would not like, or many governments would not like to involve civil society in this decision-making process, because what we see is actually that civil society can come to an agreement much easier. I mean, we are working together in, in like many forums as civil society organizations, and even we have very you know, diverse ideological background and different perspectives, but, but we can have a real dialogue about these things, and that, that's really missing from, from the, sometimes from the discussions in the or a bit among the governments. So thank you very much for accepting our invitation and uh, thank you for your very valuable thoughts and thank you. Thank you.